on this week's podcast. I wanted to repost a podcast that I did a few months ago about the Blue Zones. There's a new Netflix documentary, How to Live to 100, Secrets of the Blue Zones. Except, as always, when talking about the Blue Zones, they get the message wrong when it comes to diet. If you look at the Blue Zones, Sardinia, Okinawa, Icaria, the Nicoya region of Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, in four out of those five Blue Zones, meat is eaten with enjoyment, with relish. I've been to multiple blue zones. I used to live in the Nicoya region of Costa Rica, lots of meat eaten there. And if you look at the research for the Nicoya region, it's only really a blue zone for men. And clearly the research there shows that men in the Nicoya region of Costa Rica eat more animal fat and more meat than men in other regions of Costa Rica. And they live longer. So go figure. Icaria and Greece, I have not been to, but I've been to many of the Aegean islands right near Icaria. I've been to Paxos. I've been to Antipaxos. I've been to Mykonos. No, I didn't party on Mykonos, and that's not my deal. But I've been to a bunch of islands right by Icaria in Greece and talked to people about what Icaria is like. And I've seen research on Icaria showing they eat tons of meat. What else do they say about Icaria? They love to party. (laughs) They love to sing and dance, and they're happy people, and they're carefree. Might that have something to do with their longevity? Absolutely. But plant-based diets? No. None of Greece ate plant-based diets. I looked all over the Mediterranean in Greece for plant-based diets, and everyone told me that they treasured meat and organs. Everyone I talked to, I've done content about this. Sardinia, Okinawa, same deal. Both of those blue zones, quote unquote, eat significant amounts of meat. So this notion that the blue zones are plant-based is complete bullshit. The one blue zone that is kind of plant-based is Loma Linda, but that's because the Seventh-day Adventists there are a religion that enforces or leans into a plant-based diet. Why? Basically because (laughs) they've realized appropriately, accurately, that meat increases libido because it has unique nutrients that are valuable for libido. This is the story of Harvey Kellogg that I tell in this podcast and the idea that cornflakes was originally developed to help with increased libidinous desires happening at the Battle Creek Sanitarium in the late 1890s. And Instagram actually censored that post and took it down for saying saying it was misinformation, but it's clearly known history. So the notion that the Blue Zones are plant-based is just false. But there's a lot we can learn from the Blue Zones, and I talk about that in this podcast. I wanted to repost it because there's been a lot of talk about the Blue Zones recently with this Netflix documentary. I don't really understand why the plant-based agenda always gets pushed like this, but if I think about it, My suspicion is that there are industry interests behind this. There's a lot of money to be made in garbage plant-based meats. Guess what? There's not a lot of money to be made from steaks and hamburger, but there's a lot of money to be made from sawdust and seed oil-filled processed plant-based foods. And it's all part of this crazy narrative that is just hurting humans. And that's why I keep talking about it. So enjoy this podcast on the Blue Zones. Share it with someone you know who's been swayed or confused by the recent Netflix documentary. And let me know what you guys want to hear more of in the future. What is up, truth seekers? To end the month of January, I wanted to do a final Ask Me Anything podcast. I've been enjoying these recently and address one of the most common questions that I get. It is a combination of a question and something that is stated as almost a truism or a reflexive response when talking about animal-based diets. And this question is, What about the blue zones, Paul? Doesn't everyone know? It's almost said, like I mentioned, as a truism by nutritional pundits, genetic researchers across the globe, that in these plant-based dietary places, specifically the blue zones, or I should reverse that statement, in the blue zones, the diet is plant-based. Everyone knows that, right? Well, I'm going to question that in this podcast. And people live longer than average there, right? Therefore, we know that a plant-based diet is good for longevity. And this statement is so fraught with problems that it makes my head spin. And I wanted to do a full uh, solo podcast answering that question and talking about why this is a fallacy, uh, why if you hear someone say this, you should run in the other direction, don't walk, and equip you all with uh, armaments, with... uh, evidence that you can use in discussions that you may find at parties or dinners or birthdays or holidays, because certainly all of us are going to encounter this statement. It has somehow crawled, squirmed its way into our consciousness like so many of these unsubstantiated vegan plant-based ideologies that you'll be at a dinner party and someone will say, but don't all the people in the blue zones eat 
plant-based? And don't they all live a long time? Okay, so where do we begin? Let's begin with the history of what the Blue Zones are. They're not something that existed before 2005. Dan Butner is a gentleman who coined the term along with a couple of other researchers um, in a expedition or a series of journeys with National Geographic in 2005. And what they found were five regions of the world that they picked, um, they sort of cherry picked these regions, Sardinia in Italy, which is an island in the Mediterranean, Icaria in Greece, Loma Linda in Southern California, Okinawa in Japan, many of us have heard of. And the final one is the Nicoya region of Costa Rica, which is where I live right now um, on the Guanacaste Peninsula of Costa Rica on the West Coast. So these are the five regions they chose. And what they did with these regions was say, look, here are five regions of the globe where people live on average longer than their uh, compatriots in other parts of the country. Uh, and specifically in the Nicoya region of Costa Rica, it's just the males who have uh, significant longevity, which is an interesting question to consider. What's the difference between men and female? And in Sardinia, in Italy, it's the same thing. It's the men who have longevity, but not the women. So there's something else going on there. And this is never talked about with blue zones, kind of an inconvenient fact. But the women in Nicoya don't have longevity. And the women in Sardinia don't appear to have the same longevity that the males do. Uh, in Loma Linda, both men and women appear to live about seven years longer than the average Californian population. We will talk about that later in this podcast and clarify that number uh, and relate it to California Mormons. So stay tuned for that. In Okinawa, people do tend to live longer than the average Japanese citizen. And um, in Icaria and Greece, we do see some longevity relative to the uh, overall population in Greece. Now, the first thing to point out is that in these regions, except for Loma Linda, meat is eaten. Unequivocally, meat is eaten. These people do not eat plant-based diets. Dan Butner would claim that meat is eaten as a condiment, but I will show you lots of evidence in this podcast that that is not the case. And if you've ever been to Icaria in Greece, or you heard the podcast I did previously with Mary Ruddick, who spent time there, they eat a lot of meat. They are barbecuing whole lamb and eating the organs. The same in Sardinia, where they have a traditional dish called sarda pig. And the same in Okinawa, where pork is celebrated as a delicacy and eaten widely. And uh, incidentally, in Nicoya of Costa Rica, animal foods are the center of the diet. So Dan Butner is just a little bit off topic here, but even Dan Butner admits that meat is eaten in the blue zones and then sort of goes on quickly in this interview. I'll show a clip from an interview he did with Mark Hyman to say, but we've chosen with our blue zones uh, commercials, with our blue zones push, to make it plant-based. So I'm gonna roll this short clip from an interview Dan Butner did with Mark Hyman. And you will see that he admits that meat is, in the blue, meat is eaten in the blue zones. He then tries to qualify it real quickly and say, oh, it's just this condiment, which we know if you really go to those places is not the case at all. And then he goes on to say, but we decided that meat isn't something you wanna eat. So we're gonna go plant-based to the blue zones. So we'll roll this quick clip, then I will be right back. Some interesting data on like, you know, meat and, and whether it's harmful or helpful. And a lot of it has to do with like what the context of the overall diet is. You know, my, my view on meat eating, I mean, in all honesty, in blue zones, people did eat meat. It was, you know, they typically knew the name of the animal and they took care of the animal for yeah. a long time. And then- Jimmy the goat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was time for the wedding. Um, but it it was uh, uh, infrequent, often as a condiment. But for my Blue Zones work, and I work now in uh, 26 cities with mm. 26 Blue Zone projects, and I have you know website meal planner. We made the decision to stay 100% plant based on what within the Blue Zone uh, family. Okay, so that is Dan Butner, the guy who came up with this concept, admitting that the Blue Zones as a plant-based tool, as a plant-based surrogate, as a plant-based uh, piece of evidence are kind of bullshit. Now, the other piece of this equation that is kind of shady is that there were many regions of the world that were left out of these five zones. Uh, there are many regions of the world that we might characterize as a blue zone. The population of Hong Kong has one of the largest, longest life expectancies in the world. It's around 85 years last time I checked, and they are number three 
per capita in terms of meat consumption at 1.5 pounds per day. Should we make Hong Kong a blue zone? Well, they're not plant-based and there's no way that you could even twist that narrative in a way that would suggest they were plant-based. So that would be quite inconvenient for Dan Buettner. You may have heard me talk to my friend Tommy Wood uh, a few years ago about his ancestry in Iceland. And um, I think at least one side of his family still lives there. He has multiple grandparents who live in Iceland. And Iceland is the size of Rhode Island and they have a much higher percentage of that population that are centenarians and super centenarians. I think super centenarians are people who live over 110 years. I just lump them all together because if you're living over 100, you're, that's freaking old. Incidentally, or I should add as an asterisk, if I live to be 100, I want to be serving when I'm 100. I don't want to be 100 and decrepit or super skinny. I want to be 100 and strong. So the only way I want to live to be 100 is if I'm kicking ass when I'm 100. Okay, back to our normally scheduled piece of intellectual content here. Tommy notes that the diet of Iceland is fish, lamb, pork, fatty meats, uh, and these animals, these ruminant animals, are amazing at converting lichen and moss into meat. They also eat a lot of dairy in Iceland. So animal products are a huge part of an Icelandic diet where the rate, where the number of centenarians and super centenarians per capita is higher than many places in the world. And again, they are eating lots of animal products. This is just two examples of places in the world. We can find many pockets where meat is eaten uh, with enjoyment, with uh, lar in large amounts around the world that are left out of this concept of blue zones. So from the beginning, we can raise our hands and say, good old Dan, how'd you pick those five? This, this smacks of a little Ansel Keys cherry picking, if you ask me. Super excited about this, guys. Hard and Soil just released a new supplement. It's called Joint Strength and Repair. What's interesting about this? This contains trachea and scapula cartilage. When I look at the research regarding the majority of collagens on the market, they're made from hoofs and hides, which means number one, it's a very low quality collagen that's not complete. It doesn't contain all of the different types of collagen, but this does because it has hyaline cartilage from the scapula. And a lot of collagens on the market are also contaminated with heavy metals. Not so with this one, we test it all the time. The interesting thing about trachea cartilage is that it's been studied and found to contain unique peptides that assist in wound healing and modulate the immune system. So there's something about the trachea of an animal that has unique wound healing properties. This is the work of surgeon John Pruden, now deceased, but you can find that research online if you're interested. So what we put in here is trachea and scapula cartilage to use a much, much higher quality cartilage to improve joint strength and repair. There you go. And we put a little bit of bone matrix, which is a microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, the highest quality bone from the cortical region of the bone to help with bone healing. So if you have joint issues or are looking to repair joints, check it out. Joint Strength and Repair, now available at Heart and Soil Supplements, heartandsoil.co. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, I will mention that I recently in Australia went straight to the bottom of a wave with my head and hit my head directly onto the sand. So I've got a little bit of a neck injury and a back injury. Thankfully, there's nothing fractured or massively bad that I'm aware of, but I've definitely got some stiffness in my neck and my lower back. And I've been throwing about six capsules of joint repair into my morning raw milk with honey. So check us out at heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical health. And I'm so proud of what we're doing over there. Okay. Now, Let's put aside these five blue zones and examine the concept that vegan or vegetarian diets are associated with decreased morbidity, decreased mortality, or longevity in literature. And this type of literature is not something that we have a lot of interventional literature on, unfortunately, because when you are studying something like longevity or overall mortality, you essentially must do epidemiology, which is uh, essentially synonymous with observational research. So this is the caveat that I will try to always make when I am discussing epidemiology, aka observational research, that this is observational research. And the problem with this type of research, I get questions about this all the time in my direct messages, my DMs on Instagram, et cetera, is that it has so much potential to be confounded by two things called healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. And if you've listened to any of my content, those terms probably ring some bells in your memory because you've heard me say them so many times. And I continue to find it incredibly important, indispensable 
to clarify these terms for people and to get the idea out there to help express, to help communicate to the public that these things confound epidemiology observational research. Because how often do we see on the news another headline, eggs, bacon, et cetera, walking down the street is associated with a bad effect. And I get I got a DM the other day. Somebody said, how do you respond to the association between red meat and cancer? And I'll do another aside in a moment and talk about how I responded that the, to that DM. But the first thing I said in response to that direct message was, do you understand that correlation is not causation, that observational studies are valuable for generating a hypothesis, which must then be tested by an interventional study, but cannot be used to draw causative inference? It is impossible. It is really just incorrect to do that is a folly and it will lead us down a path of ruin and deception. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at epidemiology and we're going to take all of those caveats into this and say, none of this is causative. This is just correlation from which we can draw a hypothesis. And these are usually surveys. People are asked, what do you eat? And then they are asked, how healthy are you? And we can look prospectively or we can look retrospectively. A lot of these are prospective studies to see how long people live and what their mortality is. And we can look for evidence that a vegan or vegetarian diet may be associated with less mortality. Now, there are many studies, which I will point out here. If you're watching on YouTube, I will do screen shares. If you're listening to this podcast, then I will read the titles of these studies for you so that you can go and look them up if you so desire. I try to always put as much actual solid science into these podcasts as I can so that you guys can uh, substantiate what I'm saying. And if you ever need more uh, in this sense, you can go to either Radical Health at heartandsoil.co, give the team over there an email. The folks there will send you refer research, um, or you can send me a DM on Instagram, and I'm trying to get to all of those these days. So let's start with a couple of epidemiology studies and really start to examine this notion. Does a vegetarian diet always associate with more uh, longevity, or are there issues with this statement, which would be something that vegans and vegetarians are pretty proud of, but there's a couple of holes in this argument too. So let's start with this one. The title is Vegetarian Diet and All-Cause Mortality, Evidence from a Large Population-Based Australian Cohort, the 45 and Up Study. If you just read the conclusions, they say, um, we found no evidence that following a vegetarian diet semi-vegetarian diet, and I think they are referring to a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet, and a vegetarian diet in this paper refers to a vegan diet, or a pesco-vegetarian diet has an independent protective effect on all-cause mortality. And this was a large study. This was 143,096 participants, mean age 62.3 years. There were 46.7% men, and they were followed um, they were all over 45 years old and they were followed for a number of years uh, in the study and they found no protective effect of a vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, again, which is probably lacto-ovo or uh, a pesco-vegetarian diet. Now, I just want to comment on something about a pesco-vegetarian diet real quickly. I tweeted this recently. If you don't follow me on Twitter, you may want to do so there. Um, I said, a pesco-vegetarian diet is a great way to get heavy metal toxicity. <laughs> there are so many examples now of people that I've known, famous people in the media, including uh, Tony Robbins, including, well, what's the guy's name on Sirius XM? I'll think of it, Howard Stern, uh, who had frank heavy metal toxicity from a pesco-vegetarian diet. So if you are including a lot of fish in your diet, be careful. Check your heavy metals, check your lead, check your arsenic, check your cadmium, check your mercury. You can check blood levels of these things. It's super easy. Uh, you don't need to do a provoked test, although they are stored in bones and a provoked test may be a more accurate measure or it may give you another data point. You can just get a blood level of lead, cadmium, arsenic, mercury, and uh, get a sense of how heavy metal toxic you are. Now, the blood levels will be more acute. A provoked test with DMSA, DMSO, or EDTA may be a little more long-term in terms of your stores of these heavy metals. But I've seen this in my clients repeatedly, even if they have a binge. I had a client once who had opa, which is a type of fish from the grocery store. And he said, oh, this opa was on sale. And get lo and behold, he'd been eating a lot of opa that week. His heavy metals were off the charts in simply a week from this acute exposure. I've seen it in clients who were eating wild salmon three to four times a week. They had elevated levels of mercury. These are not good things, guys. So this is another corollary question that I get sometimes. What about fish on an animal-based diet? My answer is theoretically, fish is great 
I don't think you need the omega-3 fatty acids from fish. I addressed that last week in the Ask Me Anything podcast where I talked about the importance and the availability of getting omega-3 fatty acids from ruminant animal fat. But fish are also quite contaminated with heavy metals. Be aware of this. Even if you're eating wild salmon, it has significantly more mercury than you're going to get in beef or chicken or lamb or turkey. And this is going to accumulate in your body. If you're doing things like tuna, buyer beware. That's a big problem. Mahi-mahi, grouper, even those fish have moderate to high levels of heavy metals and the benthic fish too. The shellfish, the mussels, the scallops, the clams, the lobsters, the crabs, a lot of these things sink to the bottom and accumulate in those fish. So this is not a good recipe for long-term success. Once a week, sure. A couple of times a month, no problem. More than that, I think you're eating some of the more dirty animal foods on the planet. Just be aware and check your heavy metals. I live in Costa Rica now. I surf a lot. I've thought about getting into free diving. I'm horrible at holding my breath, but I want to get better at it. And one of the, I think, disincentives for me to get into free diving is that free diving is often connected with spear fishing, which sounds super fun and interesting, except I'm not going to eat anything I catch for the most part, maybe a small fish here and there, but most of what I catch, I'm going to feel so guilty about the heavy metals from that. And like I said before, I don't think there's a whole lot unique in fish that you want to get in your diet that you can't just get from ruminant animal meat and organs, lamb, beef, bison, these type of things. Now, theoretically, historically, is this always been an issue? Probably not. I think we're polluting the ocean. This is part of our life cycle on the planet as humans. Um, not necessarily intrinsically part of our life cycle, just part of our life cycle. Uh, historically, we've, we've done this to the oceans. And so things are changing. I often say to people, would you eat a cow from Tokyo that's grown in the middle of Tokyo? It's inhaling that horrible air or a cow that's grown in the middle of Beijing. Or do you want a cow from rural Georgia, like white oak pastures, or from perhaps rural Costa Rica, right up the street from my house, there's cows grazing on the land here on the Guanacaste Peninsula. I would rather eat the cow that's in cleaner air. But what if all of the fish you eat is equivalent to the cow in Tokyo or the cow in Beijing, because it's all kind of swimming in dirty water. And the longer the fish lives, the more it's going to accumulate these heavy metals. This is a problem with excess fish in the diet. And again, I don't think you need fish for omega-3s. You can get plenty from ruminant animal fat exactly because you are avoiding seed oils because you are avoiding omega-3, excuse me, omega-6s, which share the same synthesis pathway to the end result, those longer chain omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, as I talked about last week on the podcast. So pescatarians, lacto-ovo-vegetarians, vegetarians, no improvement in mortality in this very large study in Australia in adults, about half of whom were men, slightly more than half were women who were above 45 years old. Let's look at another one. This is a study that I've talked about a lot. It's a really important study. It's called Mortality in British, British Vegetarians. Sometimes I refer to it as the UK shopper study. What's so interesting about this study is that um, they looked at a couple of different things. They looked at standardized mortality ratios and they compared vegans, well, they lumped in vegetarians and vegans together with omnivores. And then they looked at death rate ratios and they compared these for vegetarians and non-vegetarians with non-vegetarians being omnivores. And what they found were that when you looked at the standard mortality ratios for all causes in death, they were significantly below the reference level of 100 in both studies. 52 uh, based on 1,131 uh, deaths in the Oxford Vegetarian Study and 59 based on 2,346 deaths in the Health Food Shopper Study. For all causes of death, the DRR, the death rate ratios for vegetarians compared with non-vegetarians was close to one in both studies. So what they found here essentially was that British vegetarians have a low mortality compared to the general population their death rates are similar to those of comparable non-vegetarians, meaning in terms of health behaviors, suggesting that much of this benefit may be attributed to non-diastery lifestyle factors, such as a low prevalence of smoking and a generally high socioeconomic status or to aspects of the diet other than the avoidance of meat and fish. This is actually a really good illustration of what you might consider to be healthy user bias. And so when you account for this and you compare British vegetarians to British omnivores who have healthy behaviors, who are higher socioeconomic status, who have a low prevalence of smoking, then you see similar rates of death and mortality. But what happens in our population in the West is that we have been told for 70 plus years that meat is bad for us. And so who eats meat? 
the people that ride motorcycles, the people that smoke, the people who are generally of lower socioeconomic status because they're more rebellious. They don't always correlate, but we know this does happen. These are risk-taking humans, and they are willing to risk-take their way into a hamburger. And the part of that hamburger that's probably the worst for them is the special sauce with the seed oils and perhaps even the tomatoes on there, which has lectins, which could be contributing to GI distress or leaky gut. And certainly that bun, which is full of gluten and other lectins and probably has some processed sugar along with the milkshake, which has a ton of sugar, the fries cooked in seed oils and the uh, Coke on the side, perhaps, which is going to have a ton of processed sugar as well. So what we gain from this is these two very different classes of people. We have the unhealthy user bias people, the super rebellious people who are much more likely to eat meat over the last 70 years, and the healthy user bias people, the goody two-shoes, beaver cleaver types who are much less likely to eat meat over the last 70 years because that's what we've been told that it's bad for you. And we know that the healthy user bias people, the beaver cleaver types are more likely to do healthy behaviors. They're more likely to play tennis on Sunday. They're more likely to be of higher socioeconomic status. They're more likely to not smoke. They're more likely to get colonoscopies or mammograms. They're more likely to get sunlight because they're outside and they're living in places where they can be outside. They're more likely to live in areas that are suburban rather than urban and have better air quality, which we know is connected with all of this. And the unhealthy user bias participants are likely to do all of those things on the negative side of that spectrum. So this is the problem with epidemiology. Those health behaviors may correlate with uh, food choices around meat that do not actually affect their health in the same way as the bad behaviors, which is why this study is so striking. The fact that vegetarians and non-vegetarians in Britain have the same mortality when they have similar ways of life, when they have similar lifestyles, when they have similar uh, low prevalence of smoking, higher socioeconomic status, healthy behaviors. This is what healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias are all about and why epidemiology studies are so damn misleading. So the next time you see these things on the news, what you will find over and over and over is that with meat, you're always going to have this healthy user bias on one side with the vegetarians and the unhealthy user bias on the other side with the meat eaters. So these, you see results on both sides of the fence. And it's very interesting to know and important to know that there are many epidemiology studies that don't show any correlation between eating meat and poor outcomes. And when they do, it's probably because they're sampling a population in which you're seeing more of this unhealthy user bias. And there are lots of studies that don't show any benefit to vegan or vegetarian diets for mortality. And sometimes they do, perhaps because they are sampling a population which, with more of this healthy user bias present in the population. This point simply cannot be emphasized enough. I cannot tell you the literal millions of people that would benefit from understanding this more deeply. I wanna do a couple more epidemiology studies to really drive this point home and make sure all of you understand this clearly. This one is meat consumption and diet quality and mortality in NHANES-3. This is the nurse's health study, NHANES-3. And this is another very long study um, this is 17,611 participants. The NHANES-3 survey period was from 1986 to 2010. They assessed meat intake with a food frequency questionnaire. In men, white meat consumption tended to be inversely associated with total mortality, meaning the men who ate white meat had a lower rate of mortality, but there was no such association among women. Significantly decreased mortality was observed in the top compared with the bottom third of the HEI score, uh, this association was only served in men, but not in women. Meat consumption was not associated with mortality. That is all meat consumption. No red meat consumption association with mortality. And what they're finding here, okay, and they say a healthy diet, according to HEI, however, was associated with decreased total mortality in men, but not women. So this is another good example of healthy user bias. The first thing to point out in this NHANES 3 study, red meat not associated with a decline in longevity, not associated with an increase in mortality, but eating white meat was. Why is that? Is chicken gonna save your life? No, it's the fact that we've been told that chicken is the white meat and the people who are eating chicken, specifically men, are the men who are listening to the health advice. These are the men who are doing these things to avoid the saturated fat, which they're probably still getting in chicken and other places in their diet, but they're doing these things to avoid the red meat, which they've been told is so good for them. And they're also doing other good, healthy behaviors so the chicken is not what's good for them. The not eating red meat is also not benefiting them because we see no uh, negative effects from eating red meat in the population. But this is a clear behavioral effect associated with 
this uh, so this um, group of people. So again, no real association between meat and decreased longevity in that study. And we have to keep asking these questions. Where do we get these this idea that red meat is associated with decreased longevity or increased mortality? Those of you watching this on YouTube will notice that the lights just went on because the sun has now set in Costa Rica and I'm recording this at the end of a day. So slight change in podcast studio lighting, but we continue on. A couple more epidemiology studies to consider here. Mortality in vegetarians and comparable non-vegetarians in the United Kingdom. And again, what we find here, United Kingdom-based vegetarians and comparable non-vegetarians have similar all-cause mortality in this epidemiology study. This again, this one was pretty big, 60,310 persons living in UK, um, comprising 18,431 regular meat eaters who ate meat at least five times per week on average. Let's just say that I would be a super meat eater by this characterization, considering that I probably eat meat 14 times a week, twice a day, every day. Uh, 13,000 low, less frequent meat eaters, 8,516 fish eaters who ate fish but not meat, and 20,324 vegetarians, including 2,220 vegans who not eat any animal foods. So this is actually a pretty interesting study because they got a lot of vegetarians to participate. One of the flaws in some of these studies is that they have trouble recruiting vegans and vegetarians, uh, as we'll see in one that we'll address in the future. So one of the other very interesting things to note about epidemiology, which is very seldom discussed, is the difference in epidemiology that we see between the East and the West when we are looking at meat and longevity, meat and uh, mortality from various chronic illnesses. What we do see in the East is that the men who eat the most red meat have the lowest rates of heart attacks, and the women who eat the most red meat have the lowest rates of breast cancer. And I'll show you the study that corroborates that assertion, meat intake and cause specific mortality, a pooled analysis of Asian prospective cohort studies. This is a very large one. This is uh, 112,310 men, 184,411 women followed from either 6.6 .6 to 15.6 years. And what they found was that uh, ecological data indicate an increase in meat intake in Asian countries. However, our pooled analysis did not provide evidence of a higher risk of mortality for total meat intake and provided evidence of an inverse association with red meat, poultry, and fish and seafood. Red meat intake was inversely associated with cardiovascular disease mortality in men. I'll read that again. Red meat, mortal red meat intake was inversely associated with cardiovascular disease mortality in men and with cancer mortality in women in Asian countries. What could possibly be going on there? Clearly the uh, answer or the hypothesis that explains that is that in Asians, red meat is good for them. And in white Caucasians, red meat is bad for us, right? No, that's silly. That doesn't make any sense at all. What's going on here is there's a different narrative that in Asia, if you're eating red meat, you're of a higher socioeconomic status. You're doing more healthy behaviors. You're getting in the sun more. You do all the things that we saw in the UK shopper study associated with increased longevity, except in Asia, red meat has not been vilified. It's been celebrated people who eat red meat are of a higher socioeconomic status. So it completely changes the equation and completely changes the way this epidemiology looks. And that's exactly why these studies are so darn misleading. To answer the DM that I got on Instagram, I said, hey, look, there are so many studies uh, that are epidemiology that have conflicting results on cancer. If you look from the East versus the West, this one clearly shows that red meat intake is associated with the lowest rates of cancer in women. And What's going on there? Is red meat not bad for women and GI cancer? What, why is red meat associated with GI cancer in American, in westernized humans in some cases? Well, it's possible that it's happening because of unhealthy user bias. To dig deeper into that question, just for a moment, I'll go into this aside. To dig deeper into that question of red meat and colon cancer or cancer in general, you can look at the IARC report, the International Association, uh, I believe of Cancer Research or Research on Cancer, um, report from 2015. The full report was published in 2018. There's a gentleman named David Clearfield who's done quite an interesting expose on this, this uh, analysis. So the IARC, I believe, is a WHO committee that got together in 2015 in the secret location in France. They had over 400 studies to consider, and they threw all of the interventional studies out. They only included 14 studies in that assessment, this is the assessment that people go on when they say that red meat is a class two A or B carcinogen, whether you're thinking about non-processed or processed red meat. And they threw out all of the studies except for 14. 
of the 14 studies, every single one was epidemiology. They threw out all the interventional studies. They threw out all the uh, animal studies that did not show any harm with red meat and animals, and even animal studies that showed that giving bacon to rats improved their GI cancers. They threw out all those studies in their consideration. They used 14 epidemiology studies in their final decision by the WHO IARC committee. This is the study that is being touted or is being parroted by people saying that red meat is associated with cancer. And of the 14, eight showed no association between red meat and cancer. I'll repeat that. Eight of the 14 studies showed no association between red meat and cancer. Six showed an association, but of the six, only one showed a significant association. Five out of six studies the association was non-significant. And in the one single study that showed a significant association between red meat consumption and GI cancer, what we found was that the people who ate more red meat were also more obese and more insulin resistant. So again, this is unhealthy user bias at play in spades. Clearly, clearly illustrated that the people that were eating more red meat in this community were unhealthy in other ways. And so the red meat was correlating with other unhealthy behaviors, other chronic illness, and that can again be confounding. This is the problem with epidemiology studies. They are correlation, not causation, and they must be interpreted. We can generate hypotheses, which must then be tested by interventions. And it's pretty difficult to test the hypothesis with an intervention saying, oh, red meat causes cancer. That's gonna take a long time to test. We can't do the groups, we can't randomize. So then people are left trying to dream up mechanistic explanations by which compounds in red meat may be harmful to the gut, which really fall apart upon detailed examination. There really are no mechanisms by which red meat would harm the gut, not heme iron, not nitrosothiols. I've talked about this all in the past. I can talk about it again if you guys would like, but that is the subject for a future podcast. And this is again, an aside, a little bit of a mini digression on red meat and cancer. Hopefully that gives some framework for the epidemiology behind meat and longevity meat and uh, mortality. And maybe you will come to the same conclusion that I have, that there's really no good evidence that meat is going to negatively affect your longevity. Is there any evidence that meat increases your longevity? Well, there's plenty of good evidence that meat will increase your overall health, your health span, your robustness, your resilience to injury. And in, in this study, which I will show, uh, eating more red meat is associated with uh, increased male height, which is an interesting correlate as well. So I will show this study, major correlates of male height, a study of 105 countries. And what they do note in this paper is that as more meat is eaten, the GDP of the country goes up, but there's a clear association. Again, it's a correlation, not a causation, but there's a clear association between milk and meat protein and male height. And there's an inverse association between children's mortality and average male height. And so in countries that are richer, people are eating more meat and they are growing to be taller and they are having less uh, infant mortality. And I will let you draw the conclusion, conclusions from that. Total protein uh, per capita, there's a pretty darn clear, look at the R is 0.74, pretty darn clear association between protein and average male height and the inverse association between total protein or um, the developmental index uh, is showing the same correlation, uh, increasing male height, improved developmental index. And then this inverse correlation between um, the, let's go up to this one, inverse correlation between children's mortality and average male height. And then this one is fascinating too. Uh, the fertility and the average male height are also correlated in a fascinating way. So it's pretty clear that across many metrics, you have improvements in human health, or at least metrics which would suggest improvements in human health with more meat. I'm about 5'9". I used to be 5'10". Then I did jujitsu and probably broke a vertebrae in my neck. Jumped off some things like Corbett's Coulard in Jackson Hole. May have also broken a vertebrae in my neck doing that. Maybe one or the other. Now I'm about 5'9". All I can say is I wish my ancestors ate more meat. I wish I were a little bit taller. I wish I were a baller. You get the idea. But there's good correlations in the epidemiology between these things. We also know from plenty of research that meat contains tons of important nutrients that allow us to thrive as humans. If you listen to the clip beyond the clip that I posted at the beginning with Dan Butner and Mark Hyman, Dan Butner, I think, fumbles a little bit and says, we know that a plant-based diet can get you all the nutrients. Perhaps in pregnancy, you need to do a little bit. And I'm thinking, that is bullshit. There are so many nutrients that are not available on a plant-based diet that you must obtain from animal meat and organs. 
um, or that are really only sparsely available on a plant-based diet, this leads to massive deficiencies in humans. And we know this very clearly. Things like creatine, carnitine, choline, answerine, taurine, B12, K2, riboflavin. It, the list goes on and on. It, B12, it's a huge list. And these are essential for human thriving. And we're only beginning to discover all of the ways that these nutrients allow us to be optimal, optimal humans. So let's return to the concept of blue zones and examine some of these regions and what we know about them in detail. Um, and we'll get a sense of, again, how accurate uh, Butner's characterization of these may or may not have been. I think that perhaps the first one that we should start with is uh, the most famous, let's start with Okinawa. I think that just like a quote unquote Mediterranean diet, a quote, Okinawan diet has been really conflated with many things that it is not. I think it's been bastardized in many ways. No one really knows what a Mediterranean diet is. Uh, what I will say about a Mediterranean diet is that if you look at the Diet Leon study, perhaps the most effective intervention in that study was the elimination of seed oils and the replacement with something like olive oil. I think they could have done even better by replacing seed oils with things like tallow and gotten more of the animal based nutrients, but there was a clear benefit uh, to a Mediterranean diet in the Diet Leon study, but people will look at that study and attribute it to many things. I think the most compelling hypothesis from my perspective is the removal of seed oils and the decreased amount of polyunsaturated fats in the Diet Leon study rather than uh, the olive oil itself. The olive oil certainly may have uh, decreased linoleic acid and replaced seed oils, which is a good thing, but I don't think the olive oil has uniquely magical properties. I don't think it's the increased vegetables or any of these other things. I think it's the least or the lessening of processed food in the Mediterranean diet. That is the intervention. And we could get the same improvement with any diet. I will repeat this. We could get the same improvement in cardiovascular outcomes, longevity, and chronic disease with any diet that eliminates seed oils. And we see that across the board. It's just not what people focus on. They want to focus on more vegetables. Well, I think hopefully in the future with the Animal-Based Nutrition Research Foundation nonprofit that we are building, we'll be able to do studies that actually look at this question and answer it in more detail. Look, as I've said before, here's how I frame it. If you are thriving, don't change a thing about your diet. If you're eating a salad or vegetables and you're doing great, don't change. But for those who are suffering with autoimmune disease or chronic illness, uh, all sorts of issues, psychiatric issues, whatever, uh, and you're not getting the results you want and you have no hope, then I want you to understand that perhaps these plant foods are not amazing for you. That is why I do the work I do. And to exonerate meat from the incorrect vilification, the unjust vilification that it so consistently receives, mostly based on very poorly done epidemiology as we have been discussing. Nevertheless, back to the Okinawan diet. This diet has been bastardized. It's been conflated with so many things that it is not going to embody, that it doesn't actually display. I heard someone speaking on a podcast the other day saying, oh, I did the Okinawan diet. It consists of, consists of root vegetables and these, you know, blah, 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 plant foods. And I'm thinking that's bullshit. If you look at studies, it's very clear the Okinawan diet has a lot of meat. Okinawa is a region that has uh, improved longevity uh, and uh, lifespan compared to uh, mainland Japan, but there are really good studies of what the Okinawans actually eat. If you've been to Okinawa, and this has been corroborated by people on Instagram and other people who have been there, and this literature that I'm reading, you know that the Okinawans do not shun meat at all. This paper is fascinating. The title is Nutrition for the Japanese Elderly. What I will draw your attention to are a few things. The first of them is that they looked for centenarians and they looked at what these people were eating, and you can see um, you know, frequency of high intake groups at baseline five and 10 years later, how much meat, eggs, milk, vegetables, fruit, fats, and oils they were eating. And if you go down here, what you'll find in the graphics is something quite fascinating. Um, the first thing they note is that the proportion of animal fat and total fats is higher in Okinawan men versus the Akita sample, which is mainland Japan. And uh, this is essentially the same for women. So women are about the same um, between these uh, two things, between Okinawa and Akita, and Okinawa and Akita for the men, the men have more animal fat and total fats. Notably, the error bars here are pretty uh, pretty large, but uh, and the differences were not significant, but the men in Okinawa eat more meat. Um, the proportion of animal proteins is also higher. Again, not significant differences, big error bars, but they're not eating significantly less meat either. So the idea that Okinawans eat less meat than mainland Japan and that that accounts for their longevity or is part of, a, uh, of an improved um, longevity cycle or uh, an improvement in their diet that's an Okinawan diet is really 
uh, rubbish. What we do see as being significant are these things. The proportion of energy from um, proteins uh, in the Okinawan men is actually significantly higher. So that one is higher than the Akita sample. The proportion of energy from fats to total energy uh, is significantly different and higher in the Okinawan sample versus Akita in the men and in the women. And the proportion of energy from carbohydrates to total energy in the men versus uh, Okinawa versus Akita is different with the Akita sample being higher than the Okinawans. So what we can say is that the men in Okinawa get more of a proportion of their energy versus the total energy from protein. Uh, they get more from fat and they get less from carbohydrates. Well, that's strange because when I've heard characterizations of an Okinawan diet, they're saying it's all these root vegetables and it's super high carbohydrate. Again, this is not actually what is eaten in Japan according to these surveys, nor is it what people observe. They state here, in any case, the proportion of proteins of animal origin was higher than in recent Japanese, according to the National Nutrition Survey in 1989, uh, animal protein accounted for 52.9% of total proteins in the average Japanese. Now, this next section is perhaps the most striking part of this Okinawan paper. Uh, you'll see first here a graphic of the serum HDL cholesterol in the Okinawans versus the Akita uh, population, and HDL is significantly higher across all of these age groups, which start at 65 and go to 85 to 89 years old. HDL is a reasonable marker of insulin sensitivity, though not a perfect one, but this might suggest, and I wish we had fasting insulin, though we don't, that the Okinawans are more insulin sensitive. That may also account for their improved longevity. But let's just go to this paragraph here that I've highlighted. And this is something that I want to emphasize. Anytime you hear talk, someone talk about an Okinawan diet, and say that it's plant-based, and that's going to result in longevity, I want you to run the other way. And I want you to give them a kale is bullshit t-shirt. Um, and I want you to hand them a steak and say, please eat this because your brain needs more creatine. Uh, unexpectedly, I'm quoting, we did not find any vegetarians among the centenarians. The second survey for Japanese centenarians in 1975-1976 showed a similar dietary pattern the dietary patterns of their middle ages were also inquired into, and it revealed no variance from that of the contemporary Japanese. There were no vegetarians among the centenarians in Okinawa. How can Dan Buettner possibly, in good conscience, suggest that a plant-based diet is in any way, shape, or form associated with longevity in Okinawa and is part of his concept of blue zones? It drives me crazy, and it makes me think that that's just silly and misleading for people in general. Okay, let's talk about Nicoya. Let's talk about where I am right now on the Nicoya Peninsula. Again, this is a region of high longevity for elderly males, okay? Two markers of aging and stress, telomere length and uh, DHEA sulfate were also more favorable in the men. Uh, they are leaner, taller, and suffer fewer disabilities than generally men in the Costa Rican population. They go on to say, the Nicoyan diet is prosaic and abundant in traditional foods like rice, beans, and animal protein <laughs> with low glycemic index and high fiber content. Again, there's a lot of editorializing happening here. I'll go on to say, look, this is a region of high longevity, but it says it right here in the freaking abstract. <laughs> They're not eating a plant-based diet in any way, shape, or form. Yes, they are eating rice and beans. We can talk about rice and beans and why I don't think those are good for longevity at all. We know that they're both grains. Well, rice is technically a grain. Bean is a bean. Is a bean. <laughs> it's a legume, and it's going to have a lot of problems, including lectins, digestive enzyme inhibitors, et cetera. And they're going to say low glycemic index, high fiber content, sort of suggesting that that may have some longevity benefit. Again, none of that's really been shown in literature at all. But what I want to point out are two things with Nicoya, this part of Costa Rica where I am, um, is that the overall, this is not longevity for both men and women. So what's going on here? Is this an... Uh, is this a trait uh, that's associated with men? Is it just something about men's behavior? Who knows? It's not totally clear. But they say for a 60-year-old Nicoyan male, the probability of becoming a centenarian is seven times that of a Japanese male. That's a mainland Japanese male, uh, not a Okinawan Japanese male. And his life expectancy is 2.2 years, years greater than a overall uh, general Japanese male. So there is some longevity here for 
Nikoyan males. But it's so funny because this blue zones concept has really been adopted. You'll see it in the airport. They'll say blue zone, blue zone. You'll see it out on the streets or in the dirt roads. And I'm driving between Santa Teresa and Montezuma. There's blue zones, cafe and all this stuff. And people don't even realize that there's, there's no longevity here for women. It's just for these males. And we don't really understand that. But to the point that Dan Buettner is trying to advance, that there's a plant-based correlate here or that people in these longevity regions eat a plant-based diet, it's, it's not true. I, I, I've been saying bullshit too many times in this podcast. I'm not going to say bullshit again. You guys hear it enough on my Instagram, uh, but it, it really is uh, hogwash um, or bollocks. As perhaps we'll use that one for the rest of the podcast uh, because the, the traditional diet of the Nicoyan males is prosaic. It's simple. It's rice, beans, and meat, and they use a lot of animal fat. So I don't know where this concept is coming from, but the hits don't stop there, guys, because we know that uh, there's really this pattern holds true across almost every single one of these blue zones. Uh, we can look at Sardinia as well, um, which is of course in Italy and find literature to support the same assertion that in fact, they do have a lot of livestock rearing consumption of animal derived foods um, is relatively higher in the uh, mountainous regions than the rest of the Island. It's, it's clear. I mean, there's Sarda pig in Sardinia. Like if you read this paper, what you find is that, um, they do follow a uh, traditional diet, which has, as it says here, dairy products. They say it has cereal derived foods, but dairy products, they have meat, they have dairy and the shepherding people in the Hills have uh, significant meat intake. They're saying again, um, they, uh, they have consumption of fruit and vegetables and moderate meat intake. They're not plant-based in any way, shape or form. Um, we can't really tease out how much the fruit, the vegetables or the meat intake is affecting things. But what I would say is that this is to argue directly against the assertion that people in these longevity regions that are cherry picked, as we talked about in the beginning, are eating a predominantly plant-based diet. That is just not true. And I will continue to show you that with yet another paper, which we will look at from Icaria. Again, if you have questions about Icaria specifically, I did have Mary Ruddock on the podcast. We talked about her experiences in Icaria and she corroborated the fact that they eat plenty of meat there. Again, it's celebrated socio-demographic and lifestyle statistics of the oldest people greater than 80 years living in Icaria Island, the Icaria study. And again, they love to say it in the, in the freaking abstract. They talk about the blue zones, they tout this percentage, and then they talk about the fact that um, there is meat eaten as part of these diets all over the place. They're not eating a plant-based diet. Their conclusion is that modifiable, modifiable risk factors such as physical activity, diet, smoking cessation, midday naps might depict the secrets of long livers. These findings suggest that the interaction of environment, behavioral together, uh, and clinical characteristics may determine longevity. Now, this I would actually agree with. This is probably a lot of the benefits of these people, perhaps getting in the sun. They are Mediterranean. Uh, they do do things outside. The diet, they don't clarify here, but again, a lot of the diet in these places concludes meat. But I wonder what we could do in these places. How much seed oil is consumed in these places? I bet it's a vanishingly small amount or a significantly smaller amount. And I would bet it's a statistically significant smaller amount than people who they live longer than. Again, this is something else. Again, it's a hypothesis. We should test it, but this would be a very interesting thing to dig into and um, really parse out. So it, it all depends on the lens that we're looking at. But so far, we've talked about Okinawa. We've talked about the Nicoya region of Costa Rica. We talked about Sardinia and we've talked about Icaria. The last one is Loma Linda. And I saved the best for last guys for a couple of reasons. Let's talk about Loma Linda. Loma Linda is a region of longevity in California. Loma Lindans tend to live seven years longer than the average Californian. It's true. But a couple of things are problematic with this assertion. The other thing I should mention is that Loma Linda is a concentration of Seventh-day Adventists. This is a re religious group that believes that meat will contribute to carnal desires, which is probably true. <laughs> if you want to have a real libido, you probably should eat meat. There's actually a fascinating history of Seventh-day Adventists and the movement around this with Harvey Kellogg, uh, the origins of Kellogg's cereals, and the real probable reality that uh, Kellogg's was developing cereals to quell masturbation, to quell carnal desires by giving people garbage uh, processed cornmeal flakes, which were devoid in the nutrients needed to make sex hormones. So one way to chemically castrate yourself is to eat a lot of cornflakes or a plant-based diet. It's happened before. If you guys listen to the podcast I'd done a long time ago with Tim Sheaf, a world-class free runner, and Elise Parker, two recovering highly prominent vegans, 
you'll hear from both of them that, that after four or five years on a vegan diet, their libidos were shot. And when both of them incorporated meat into their diet, they found a resurgence. They basically both thought they were asexual. They're not together. They're independent people that I interviewed together. Um, and they both found a resurgence in their sex hormones. And they found this to be quite, uh, quite pleasant to, that they actually had sexual desire as a healthy human should have uh, in their life. Tim Sheaf's story is particularly remarkable. I remember when this happened a few years ago, uh, he was actually shooting with the movie Game Changers. He's a, like I said, he's a world champion free runner. And he asked them to take him out of the movie because he was doing so poorly on a vegan diet and then felt so much better when he included salmon in his diet. He remember, I remember that he talked about this in social media. The first time he ate salmon, he had a wet dream. So he had resurgence of sexuality and hormones for the first time in many, many years. Again, Elise talked about it on the podcast. She felt like she was asexual, began eating salmon and then red meat and recovered a healthy sex drive for a young mid to late twenties woman. Um, we should all have this late into our life, I believe. And so again, Kellogg, Seventh-day Adventists, what's a very effective way to chemically castrate humans? Well, give them cornflakes. So let's just put all religious discussions aside and judgments and just say, okay, the Seventh-day Adventists are concerned about carnal desires. And so they, I believe, and I could be wrong about this, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is part of the connection with these vegetarian and vegan diets is they may help to curb libido. Well, Many of us actually like our libido when used appropriately and responsibly and prefer to be a healthy human that is vital. Um, if you choose a plant-based diet to curb your libido, then that is your choice, but that's not my choice. And I don't think that's many of the choices. Uh, I don't think that's a choice for many of you listening to this podcast. Nevertheless, let's go back to the Seventh-day Adventists. Let's go back to Loma Linda. One thing to consider is that there are many regions of California, or I should say there are other populations of Californians who also experience the same longevity benefits, lifestyle and reduced mortality among California Mormons, 1980 to 2004. But the California Mormons are, they're dispersed throughout California. They don't live in a specific area. This is not considered to be a blue zone or a blue population, but they do have uh, decreased mortality. They do live on average about the same as the Loma Lindens, seven years longer than the general California population. Oh, how strange, imagine that. What are the California Mormons and Loma Lindens have in common? Well, associated with their, uh, their religion, these Californian Seventh-day Adventists also are health conscious religious groups. They say it right here, other health conscious religious groups like the Seventh-day Adventists and frequent church attenders in general also have substantially reduced, reduced mortality rates. Could this possibly be due to abstaining from smoking, having good health practices, staying married, having community, Yes, it could. Again, this is what I'm talking about with healthy user bias or these healthy behaviors that actually infer uh, a longevity benefit rather than the avoidance of meat because we see that these uh, California Mormons live just as long as the Loma Lindens and they do not shun meat in any way, shape, or form. So again, this throws further questioning, further skepticism to the idea of the blue zones when one of the key blue zones, the Loma Linda, doesn't even really look that to be that special. And let's ask the finally important question about Loma Linda. And many of you may have heard me talk about this last study or this, this study that I'm gonna show right now before. Uh, is there a decrease uh, in health outcomes or is there any potential problem with the eating a veg vegan or vegetarian diet in Loma Linda? Uh, do the Loma Lindens, the Seventh-day Adventist community who shun meat have any problems of doing this relative to the Mormons who are eating meat? And the answer appears to be yes, very possibly. So food intake, diet, and sperm characteristics in a blue zone. They even put it in the freaking title of this paper, guys, a Loma Linda study. Uh, this study showed that vegetables-based food intake decreased sperm quality. In particular, a reduction in sperm quality male factor patients would be clinically significant, would require a view. Furthermore, inadequate sperm hyperactivation in vegans suggested compromised membrane calcium selective channels. Now, Important to note that in this study, they had trouble recruiting strict vegans. There were five strict vegans. There were 26 lacto-ova vegetarians. And overall, I believe there were 443 non-vegetarians. So would love to see the study repeated with larger numbers, but this finding has been replicated in other populations. Um, and we see that there is a correlation between increased plant and vegetable intake and decreased sperm quality. Perhaps the Loma Lindens in this study are the extreme example there with the complete 
Uh, exclusion of meat being very harmful for the sperm quality. Again, it's a low numbers in those other people, 26 and five respectively for vegetarian and vegans. There's a lot of potential hypotheses here. Is it a deficiency of carnitine, which is necessary for sperm hyperactivation? Again, this is one of these nutrients only found in meat. Uh, is it increased pesticides that are unable to be detoxified or that um, are accumulating in the body because of this increased intake of vegetables? Who knows? But that to me, and I've joked about this before, you guys have probably heard this joke. That to me suggests that Loma Linda is not really a blue zone, or if it is a blue zone, I don't know what's blue other than maybe the testicles of these men who are not having good uh, sperm motility. So it's a blue ball zone, perhaps not a blue zone in terms of longevity. So again, we've gone through all five of Dan Butner's precious, celebrated, sacrosanct blue zones now, Icaria, Sardinia, Okinawa, Loma Linda, and then the Nicoya region of Costa Rica. And what we've seen is that, hey, all of these regions they are eating meat except for Loma Linda. And where they don't eat meat, they have the same uh, longevity, which is mirrored by Mormons in California who are eating meat and the sperm quality in Loma Linda is not so good. Tell me again why blue zones are valuable or why anyone reputable would ever say that plant-based diets in blue zones account for any sort of longevity or that a plant-based diet in a blue zone uh, is any correlation that's worth looking at. Tell me again why that is. I don't know. It makes me crazy. And yet it gets repeated and parroted so often that I think it just continues to mislead so many and really lead to, I fear, um, decreased or uh, really negative health outcomes for so many. So this is why I do this work. I think that there's a real narrative here. We want to believe this fairy tale. This blue zone concept is magical. It's Atlantis. It's this city of gold, this Mayan uh, fairy tale, except it doesn't exist. <laughs> There are blue zones, but there are probably regions where there are clusters of favorable genetics or uh, laid back lifestyles or increased sun or decreased seed oil consumption. That may be the main thing that we can do for longevity. And saying that there are plant-based diets associated with this is just bollocks and should not be respected and should be challenged as I'm doing at length in this podcast. Many of you will be sent this podcast if you ask this question in the DMs so that you can get the full answer I hope that you've listened all the way through. Just a few more points before I wrap this one up. We know that there are important uh, indicators of aging, epigenetic clocks, and there's interesting data on uh, life stress and epigenetic aging. And so again, a stress-free lifestyle is probably one of the more important things for longevity. Lifetime stress accelerates epigenetic aging. These are perhaps these CPG islands or this Horvath clock. This is specifically in an urban African-American cohort, the relevance of glucocorticoid signaling. You can read the study, but they say that cumulative lifetime stress may accelerate epigenetic aging, an effect that could be driven by glucocorticoid-induced epigenetic changes. These findings contribute to our understandings of the mechanisms linking chronic stress with accelerated aging and heightened disease risk. One of the reasons that I love living in Costa Rica is that life feels less frenetic here. It feels less crazy. It feels less harried. It feels less um, stressful. I drive my car on almost entirely dirt roads to go surfing. I get in the ocean every day. I get in the sun. Uh, I can see the ocean from my house. Obviously, I'm quite fortunate to be here, but there are many ways for all of us to reduce our stress and live in regions that are not quite so fast-paced. And so this is my version of the remembering. This is my way of stepping out, living more slowly. I'm still trying the best I can to make all the content that I can that will benefit you guys and make it as available and as clear as I can, but I'm doing it from a place where I believe I am much less stressed. And certainly surfing three hours a day uh, takes my mind off a lot of things that are stressful and puts me at ease in a beautiful, beautiful way. I wanna show you guys another paper that I've talked about in the past. Uh, pardon this if this is a repeat for you. The relationship between peripheral blood, mononuclear cells, telomere length, and the diet, the unexpected effect of red meat. This is one of the uh, amazing sort of funny ones that's kind of like, oh yeah, how come you didn't talk about this one, Dan Butner? Now, let's just say this before I dive into the study. Telomeres are perhaps not the best indicator of longevity. Some studies suggest they're good. Some studies suggest they're not. But what we found, what they found in this study, there was an unexpected correlation between telomere length with the frequency of consumption of red meat. How can that be? Well, what if the nutrients in red meat are essential for longevity? What if some of these magical nutrients that only found in animal foods, creatine, carnitine, choline, answerine, taurine, are improving our longevity, are improving our DNA's ability to protect itself from damage? One of the foundational central pieces 
of aging appears to be DNA damage. This has been talked about for so long. This is where the sirtuins come in and NAD. And when NAD runs out, the sirtuins can't do their job. Well, the sirtuins are involved in this DNA repair and as are the PARPs, you know, the P-PARP uh, enzymes. I talked about this with David Sinclair on a recent podcast that I reposted. But one of the most interesting parts of the NAD uh, cycle or the NAD metabolism, biochemistry in the human body, is that to regenerate NAD, you need an enzyme called NAMPT. Well, guess what? When you are insulin resistant, when you are metabolically broken, NAMPT doesn't work as well. It's almost repeated again as a truism, as a fact that as we age, NAD declines. Again, I think this is BS. There are so many things like this that are told to us in medical school. As you age, these things are normal. That is bullshit. Of course, none of us is going to be our fully formed 20-year-old hale and hearty form our whole life. But I don't believe that we have to accept the decline of aging as normal for humans. But I don't think that the way to avoid that is by avoiding meat. I think it's by embracing things like meat and organs and embracing metabolic health, avoiding seed oils. If I could make one statement in this podcast that you will take home with you, it is this. If you want to live long and if you want to live well, be metabolically healthy. Avoid seed oils. Know what things cause metabolic unhealth. Know how to check your metabolic health. Something like a fasting insulin, less than five micro IU per ml. You can get this from your doctor. Any doctor should do that test. If your doctor balks at a fasting insulin, get a new doctor. If you don't know what code to use, use obesity, use insulin resistance, use prediabetes, pay cash. It's a $35 test. Get a fasting insulin or use a continuous glucose monitor with a company like NutriSense. Know what your glucose is doing but don't follow glucose, follow your insulin sensitivity through your glucose metrics. I've done previous podcasts on that with Kara from NutriSense. I've talked about my continuous glucose monitor data. All of this stuff is in the archives of the Fundamental Health Podcast for all of you. So be metabolically healthy. That is how your NAM PT enzyme works. That is how you keep making NAD for yourself. And then you don't need an NAD supplement. If you guys heard the podcast I did with David Sinclair, we talked about NAD, we talked about the pros and cons. I'm not a fan of NAD or NMN supplementation. If you take too much of these nicotine, or I should say uh, nicotinamide or niacin derivatives, what you will find is that this will deplete your other methyl groups and people run into anxiety and other issues. I don't think you wanna mess with your human biology that much. You should be able to get everything you need from food. This is the equation that's always played in the back of my mind throughout my health journey, uh, through medical school, through PA school, through residency at the University of Washington, is there should be an easy way for humans to get everything they need to thrive. We didn't get this far in human evolution by picking a little bit of this by eating a pumpkin seed here for zinc and a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of this B12 uh, supplement. No, there are easy foods that are readily available for humans that give us everything we need. And it's involved, it simply involves pulling back a bow, shooting an animal with your buddies in the wilderness. I did this in Tanzania with the Hadza, eating the animal from most of the tail, picking a few pieces of fruit off the tree and maybe getting some honey from a beehive every once in a while, you will thrive. That is why an animal-based diet is so fascinating to me. That is the simple formula that humans have always known intuitively that kids know as babies and toddlers, they seek fruit, they seek honey and they seek meat and they may seek organs if you give them to them early enough, or you can just take some hardened soil supplements and open them on their food. But this formula is so simple. We don't need to do all these different vitamins and minerals and you need to get this vegetable, which doesn't actually grow here. Plant-based diet is a nightmare for nutrition. You have to do so many foods that would never co-occur. Humans could never have done this. Meat and organs are the key. If you're not getting fresh organs, get desiccated organs from a company like Heart and Soil at heartandsoil.co. If you are getting fresh organs, props to you because I think those are better. If you're not getting fruit, don't fear this. Listen to last week's podcast on fructose and why fruit in a food matrix with fructose there is probably different than fructose and sucrose or processed sugars. It's a simple formula for humans. It has what we need. It's what we've always sought. It's how humans have thrived. There shouldn't be this so much complexity to the human diet. This is where we get our nutrients. And look at this, it improves our telomeres. No surprise there in any way, shape or form. So in summary, the blue zones are bullshit. I'll say it at the end. Blue zones are bullshit. They're cherry picked. There are many regions of the world with increasing uh, longevity relative to general population that are left out. And across all of the blue zones, meat is eaten widely and with gusto. And the one place where it's not, they're not really that uniquely healthy. They have poor sperm quality. And the Mormons we meet live just as long. So blue zones are a fallacy. They really are a fallacy. They really are not true. They should not be used to substantiate a plant-based diet. And I think this is doing people a great disservice. 
by convincing them or by using this fairy tale, quite uh, enticing concept to suggest that there is some merit to a plant-based diet. Even in my debate with Joel Furman, he said, what about the blue zones? Look at these regions of the world where people live long and plant-based. And I corrected him at that time, and I'll continue to correct any plant-based advocates who are suggesting that now. It's simply crazy to believe that there's any scientific merit to this concept. It's a beautiful concept, but the things that are common across the blue zones are these. Exercise, a reasonable diet consisting of simple foods, which almost always includes animal foods, and you better believe it's eaten nose to tail. Absence of seed oils, I would bet. Community, and really a slower pace of life lower stress. This is probably the formula for longevity for humans. I happen to think Costa Rica is a great place for it. I hope you guys will visit us for the annual-based gathering, or if not, maybe one of them in the future. But my plan for tomorrow is to get up early, to go in the sun, to go in the ocean, to surf, to eat some liver, to eat some heart, to eat some raw testicle, maybe to get some moon memory and brain from hardened soil because I don't have any fresh brain right now, and then to spend time with friends. I'm driving up to the northern part of Costa Rica. I'm going to get to spend time with my friend Bear Grylls, some of you may have heard of him. Hopefully we'll do a reel on both of us eating organs. And then I'm flying back to Austin for a week to hang out with George St. Pierre and do some collaborations with Hardened Soil. So I think that uh, there's a lot of fun stuff in store. I got some surfing footage this week with a film crew that was here. So I'm excited to share that with you guys. But this is, I think, is how we create our own little micro blue zones. We create a nutrient rich diet that is uh, essentially devoid of processed food, devoid of seed oils, devoid of processed sugars. We surround ourselves with healthy community. We get in the sun, we exercise, we do the environmental hormetics, sauna, heat, cold, exercise, apnea training. All these things are beneficial. Occasional fasting. These things mimic uh, the hormetic effects of these plant compounds, which actually have bad side effects. And I believe are a clear net negative for humans. So I'll just say a word about that because I got myself in this rabbit hole and then I'll end this podcast. People ask this question sometimes, what about these plant-based chemicals? Do they provide a hormetic effect? Are they beneficial? And as I just hinted at, I think that their effects are mimicked by environmental hormetics. I draw a line between molecular hormesis and environmental hormesis. These are two terms that I coined, but I think there's a clear definition here. I went to my friends the other night and did a hot sauna, a very hot sauna, and a cold plunge. Both cold exposure and heat will activate sirtuin genes. It will also activate a little bit of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress increases glutathione because it turns on NRF2. So, so many of these plant molecules all are believed to be helpful because they turn on NRF2, because they are pro-oxidants. They're not antioxidants, they're pro-oxidants. Well, guess what? You can get plenty of pro-oxidation in your life. Go do some sprints, go in the sun, go exercise, go sit in the sauna and go get in a cold bath. And those environmental activities don't have side effects like a plant molecule. That is the main problem I have. But the benefits of these plant molecules are redundant. You can get them from living a life. You can get them from fasting. You can even get them from apnea training. You're holding your breath. This has been shown too. But there are no side effects because these things are not molecules. These are environmental activities. This is environmental hormesis. But plant molecules are things you ingest. Yes, they may trigger NRF2. Yes, they may increase glutathione. It's probably redundant if you're doing those other good things. And then you must not ignore the side effects of these molecules. Every pharmaceutical molecule we use in medicine, every pharmaceutical drug, we know it has side effects, whether it's ibuprofen, metoprolol, simvastatin, Crestor, which is rosuvastatin, you know, carvedilol, whatever we're using, we know it has side effects. But for some reason, these plant molecules have gotten a free pass and we forget that they're just similarly pharmaceuticals from plants. Yes, they can be used as medicine. Digitalis is from a plant. You know, Berberine is essentially the same molecule that occurs in the French lilac. These molecules are from plants and they do things. Berberine is like metformin actually, but they have bad side effects associated with them. That is what we must not ignore. Why use a molecule with side effects when you can get the same benefits from living well? That's why I'm not a fan of plant compounds for hormetics. That's why I'm not a fan of xenohormesis from plants. That's why I think that is a short-sighted narrative and I don't do that. That's why I avoid vegetables. That's why I avoid leaves, stems, roots, and seeds of plants with all these defense chemicals, but I indulge, I engage in heat, sauna, cold, exercise every day in the sun, sunlight, fasting, occasional ketosis by intermittent fasting. And a new thing that I've been doing is some small degree of apnea training. Again, I said my breath holding stinks. I'm working on it. But all those things I think are activating these hormetic mechanisms in the human body. You don't need plant chemicals. You are better off without them. Your bowels are better off without them. Overall, as a human, you're better off without them. That is sort of a wide ranging perspective on vegetables to cap this podcast on why the blue zones are BS, 
why I'm not a fan of this, why this narrative is false, why it has so many holes in it, and why you should include meat, fresh organs, or desiccated organs in your diet, why I think fruit and honey are a great part of the diet. I'm a huge fan of raw dairy these days. If you can't do that, do some bone meal, like bone matrix from hardened soil, and I think that is the formula for thriving. And I just want to highlight the one thing I said earlier, which I think is a super important point. One of the cool things about podcasting and New Link Solo Cast is that there's no script for this. I have a few ideas what I want to talk about, and I just go and I riff. And every once in a while, something comes up, and I want to repeat this one, which I thought was cool. Uh, that I said on this podcast, which is that our intrinsic nature of humans allows us or really directs us to seek the foods that will allow us to have the best vitality, virility, and I believe longevity goes along with that. It's a simple equation. We know how to get the foods that will give us what we need as humans. It's animal meat and organs. It's hunting, followed by the sweet, uh, colorful fruit and delicious honey that we find in nature. Raw dairy is a recent addition to this in human evolution. If you can tolerate it, it's incredibly nutrient rich. And I think it's a great thing to have. I found real differences in the way my body reacts to raw versus pasteurized dairy. Be aware that a lot of things are pasteurized these days. If you can't get raw dairy uh, and you don't like dairy, just do something like bone meal because I think calcium is good to have in the human diet. So hopefully that was helpful. As I'm doing these podcasts, I always talk about a lot of different things. I answered so many different questions as we were talking about the blue zones. So many things came up. Don't get confused by epidemiology. Don't believe the plant-based narrative on blue zones. Do include meat, organs, fruit, honey in your diet, maybe some raw dairy if you're lucky, and do live a radical life and do reclaim your birthright to radical health. My friends, my truth seekers, signing out for today. This is Carnivore MD, aka Paul Saladino. You can call me whatever you want. And I love you all. Have a good rest of your evening. Thanks for joining me.